Testing on YouTube. Testing on YouTube. Testing on YouTube. Testing on YouTube. Testing. All right, I think YouTube is also working. Yeah, hear ya. All right, I appreciate it. No free will. <clears throat> Let's close out of YouTube then. Let's open up X. And then we'll wait a minute for it to start, and then we'll go ahead. Look at these two snakes here. Got a nice little cute small mamba, and then we got the big scary fanged mamba. Let me actually blow my nose real quick. All right, I think X should be starting here any second. We got a good one for you guys today. Another Mamba fight, a Mamba battle. All right, I think we're live on X. Let's make sure it works. Testing on X, testing on X. Broadcast is not available, what does that mean? Testing on X. All right, it works. Nice. All right, let's go ahead and get started then. How's it going, everybody? Uh, so I got a, I realized I was slacking on the, on the accessories, you know, so I haven't worn a weird hat in a while, so I've got a, a little Scythian hat here, so this is what a Scythian hat looks like, but you could also think of it as a Smurf hat, so it's kind of a weird, in between, somewhere between a Scythian hat and a Smurf hat, but, uh, we are also... Going to be using a new horn today. This is an Aztec death whistle. So instead of the uh, spiral didgeridoo, we'll start with this one. So let's go ahead. All right, hopefully that uh, inspired fear in your enemies. And welcome to another Hoopo stream. That was a uh, Aztec death whistle. So today we're going to be looking at, uh, we're going to be doing another Battle of the Mambas stream. So we had a one of our more popular streams a couple weeks ago compared two different types of uh, vision mambas. So mambas are a type of state space model. You could think of it like an alternative to the transformer, kind of like a RNN or an LSTM, something like that. But we looked at two different types of Mambas that were in the image space, and we had them battle it out, and we compared two different papers that came out roughly about the same time. We're going to be doing something kind of similar today, except uh, obviously these are going to be in different modalities. So we're going to be looking at these two papers here. This one's called Video Mamba State Space Model, which is the type of model that a Mamba is for efficient video understanding. And video understanding is the specific task that we're going to be doing with this Mamba. In a video understanding task, you get a video, which is a sequence of frames, okay, a sequence of images, and the output is text, basically, you or classifying it into some category, where to get the uh, problem correct, you basically have to understand the video, hence video understanding. This is released out of a couple different Chinese institutions here. You got University of Chinese Academy of Sciences, Shenzhen Institute of Advanced Technologies, State Key Laboratory for Novel Software Technology in Nanjing. And this was released on the 12th of March, 2024, so just this week. Uh, 
we also have this one here. This one's called Motion Mamba, efficient and long sequence motion generation. So generating these motions, which are sequences of basically uh, joint angles. You can think of it for a skeleton. Here's a skeleton or an armature, as it's called in the animation field, uh, for different 3D characters. So even though these look like different 3D characters underneath that, they're all basically using the same armature skeleton and this Mamba generates those given a piece of text. Using hierarchical and bidirectional selective SSM, the SSM here is the state space model that we saw here. So slightly different modality, right? This is dealing with motion generation. This is dealing with video understanding, but both of these papers came out basically the same day. So we're going to have a little bit of a battle of a Mambas, but we're going to kind of just compare them as papers, you know, maybe by reading both papers at the same time, we can compare and contrast, see if there's things that apply to one modality that don't apply to a different modality. Maybe there's some commonalities between them that we can learn about. I don't know. Figured we'd get kill two birds with one stone. So why don't we start by reading the abstracts for these? Damn, how's it going? Akan, Rumpel, Mama D, Ice River, Longtran, Majetti, Kareem. Did I get a chance to see the Video Mamba Sweet paper I sent on Discord? I don't know. Maybe? If it's this paper, yes. If it's a different paper, probably not. I apologize. Uh, all right, so let's start off here. Addressing the dual challenges of local redundancies and global dependencies in video understanding. So here what they're talking about is local redundancy refers to the fact that uh, a lot of videos every single frame of the video might have uh, a lot of redundancy between frames, right? So between frames, you kind of have the same exact frame over and over again with just slight changes. So there's a lot of redundant information in a video. And then global dependencies refers to the fact that a video being a long sequence of frames, there might be specific relationships between different frames that are very far apart, right? So global refers to kind of something that is very far apart or maybe think of it as like from the very beginning of the sequence to the very end of the sequence. So video understanding is a pretty hard problem in general. This work innovatively adapts to the Mamba, uh, adapts the Mamba to the video domain, overcomes the limitation of existing 3D convolutional neural nets to video trans and video transformers. These are two other types of architectures. Uh, convolutional neural nets are a little bit older now, but you still occasionally see them. And of course, transformers are the most popular architecture right now, just because they're very. Uh, it's very easy to take your problem and turn it into a problem that can be consumed by a transformer. The linear complexity operator of the Mamba enables efficient long-term modeling, which is crucial for, crucial for high-resolution long video understanding. Extensive evaluations reveal Video Mamba has scalability, which means that you can, without expense, extensive data set pre-training, thanks to a novel self-distillation technique. Sensitivity for recognizing short-term actions, superiority in long-term video understanding, and compatibility with other modalities, demonstrating robustness in multimodal contexts. Throughout the through these distinct advantages, Video Mama sets a new benchmark for video understanding. So they're kind of claiming state of the art, but not entirely, offering a scalable and efficient solution for video comprehensive video understanding. All the code and models are available, so they do release the code for this. Most of the Mamba papers are quite open source; they kind of publish everything. So it's a bit refreshing to see that. All right, so that's Video Mamba and. Now let's kind of go over Motion Mamba. I think the easiest way to really understand what Motion Mamba is doing is this is what it's outputting, right? So you're inputting a piece of text like this. The character first walks, then jumps, then later runs in a straight line. Or the character performs a backflip when doing an exercise, right? And then what the Motion Mamba does is it'll generate uh, the animation for this, which is going to be a sequence of keyframes where those keyframes are basically specific configurations or positions or poses of that armature or skeleton. And if you play them, right, you just hit play, you assume some kind of uh, time in between them, in between them, you get these animations and you can see that these are other models. So motion diffuse, MDM and MLD, those are previous methods that they're comparing to. You can see that none of them do a backflip, but the motion Mamba does do a backflip. So this is kind of like a generative motion model using 
uh, Mamba architecture, and this is more of a video understanding model using the Mamba architecture. Uh, all right, let's look at the abstract here. Human motion generation stands as a significant pursuit in generative computer vision, while achieving long sequence and efficient motion generation remains challenging. So again, we see the same problem that we saw in the video understanding, this long sequence or global dependencies, right? Like the, the just the fact that motion generation, much like video, is a very long uh, sequence problem. It's a lot of data because you're, you have this extra time domain, right? So it's different from the image modality. Uh, or the text modality in that sense. Recent advancements in state-space models, notably Mamba, have showcased considerable promise in long sequence modeling with an efficient hardware-aware design. You're going to see this pop up in both these papers over and over again, right? The main benefit of these Mamba models is the uh, speed and efficiency, so they don't really take as much memory as a transformer, just because what they're doing is they have this uh, hidden state that they kind of keep passing forward and propagating through time as opposed to an... Uh, uh, transformer, which looks at the entire sequence and kind of does all of the sequence using this attention mechanism to all of the other se to the sequence itself, right? So, transformer is very powerful, but very memory and compute intensive. Mamba models not as necessarily powerful, even though both of these papers are going to argue that they are powerful. But because they have this kind of constraint on the hidden state that gets passed forward, they are much more efficient. Uh, adapting SSMs to motion generations faces hurdles since the lack of a specialized design in the architecture. To address this challenge, we propose Motion Mamba, a simple and efficient approach that presents the pioneering motion generation model. Specifically, we design a hierarchical temporal Mamba block and also a bidirectional spatial Mamba block. So they, they're going to have two slightly different takes on the Mamba block. This, I don't, so. We'll, we'll get to it, but the one thing I don't like about this paper is the they talk about how it's simple here. It's, it's not really that simple. It's a little bit complex, but uh, overall, they get good results. So varying numbers of isolated SSM modules across a symmetric unit architecture. So there's actually a diffusion model in this paper, believe it or not. And these guys are also going to claim state of the art. They're going to basically say this is the uh, best best diffusion-based method, aka generates the best thing, but the metrics they're using for this are 50% FID improvement and four times faster. They're a little sketchy, so we'll get into that as well. Joints. Nah, it's simple. <laughs> I don't know if this looks quite simple to me. <laughs> Does this look simple? Maybe, maybe not, right? Okay. Uh, both of these introductions are kind of the same because they're they're just kind of advocating for the Mamba. So we're going to kind of read both of them at the same time. We're going to look at, uh, we're going to be bouncing back and forth between these papers, but if you guys get confused, just let me know. So right off the bat, in the in this Motion Mamba paper, they, they this immediately made me suspicious about this paper, but look how strong this statement is. Human motion generation stands as a holy grail in the generative computer vision. And like, I had to kind of blink twice there. I don't know about human motion generation being the holy grail of computer vision. That seems extremely strong of a statement to say. I kind of prefer the statement here, where video understanding stands as a cornerstone in the domain of computer vision. I feel like video understanding is a little bit more important than human motion generation. They're both subsets of computer vision, right? There's a lot of different types of computer vision tasks, There's detection, segmentation, video understanding, video generation, right? Even video generation, I would say, is more important than human motion generation. But I don't know. I just thought that this was a what a, what a way to open this paper with an extremely strong and opinionated statement. Um. Okay, but here they're going to go into a discussion about previous uh, architectures that have been tried, and mainly it's going to go into two different buckets here. You're going to have either convolutions or transformer-based models. So convolutional or transformer-based diffusion methods exhibit limitations in generating long-range motion sequences. Transformers have this problem of substantial increase in computational requirements because you have this attention map uh, which means that the inference speed remains adversely affected by the attention mechanism's quadratic scaling, where qu the quadratic scaling comes from the fact that you're literally creating this square that is the attention map 
between the sequence and itself. So the length of the sequence, you square that, or the the uh, memory and compute complexity of the attention operation is going to scale quadratically with the length of the input sequence, which uh, the Mamba does not have that, right? The Mamba, it's the same. So basically because that hidden state, you're defining some capped uh, length for it, no matter how long your sequence is, you're always going to be basically passing that forward. So it's going to be linear uh, scaling with respect to the uh, length of the sequence as opposed to quadratic. So if you have a problem where you have very long range sequences, such as this, uh, these animations or video understanding, then these Mamba models are going to have an advantage there. So similar kind of story here in the video paper, you have attention based models marked a significant advancement by effectively capturing long range dependencies within video sequences, video sequences, enhancing temporal relationship understanding. But they often come with high computational costs for long sequences. Our video Mamba is a linear complexity operator that has faster speed and lower GPU consumption. So both of these papers kind of making the same uh, reasoning and kind of motivation for using these Mambas in these particular types of um, domains. Modern versions of SSMs have a capability greatly improved by the introduction of parallel training techniques carefully designed to handle sequential data. So what they're talking about here is that older versions of SSMs, such as RNNs and LSTMs, part of the problem that was that whenever you would train them, you would have to basically figure out what the hidden state was. So like when you're training an RNN, in order to push gradients, you have to push gradients all the way back through the history as of that kind of recurrent process these modern Mamba models, you can train them in parallel because they don't have this kind of like, it, the, the way that the architecture works out, you can kind of almost think of them at, treat them kind of like a convnet. So you can train the entire kind of history and push a whole gradient based on that as opposed to an RNN, which you couldn't do that. So Mambas are kind of the more, the most modern and efficient uh, type of SSM. And the, the fact that you can train them in parallel like that is why Mambas have kind of beat out the RNNs and all the kind of variants of RNNs. Uh, I think this is pretty much what we said here. The motion Mamba is going to be a diffusion-based generative system, so they're ultimately they're going to be using the Mamba as part of a diffusion model, where the diffusion model is going to be taking in, or it's going to be conditioned on this piece of text, and then ultimately the diffusion model goes from a noise distribution to uh, a point that represents noise to a point that represents a specific motion trajectory and that specific motion trajectory should be related to the text that you conditioned that denoiser on. Uh, the two special blocks that they're gonna come up for this are the hierarchical temporal mamba and then the bidirectional spatial mamba. So the temporal is gonna be dealing with the time domain, right? So over the, the dimension in which the animation is right the time dimension and then the spatial is the basically within each individual keyframe uh that's the spatial dimension so in an image spatial means for example in the height and width of the individual image and then the time would be basically which frame of the video you're in so two different types of mamba blocks depending on which dimension you're dealing with uh okay so Maybe one extra thing here in this Motion Mamba paper, they the way that they're going to be evaluating and ultimately calling this state-of-the-art performance, right? This is a bold claim. They're going to be claiming that based on an FID metric, which I generally don't like these quantitative metrics. I've gone down this rant like 50 times in a row, so I'll spare you guys the rant, but a FID, a reduction in 50% over prior state-of-the-arts on the human ML3D data set. So as soon as I saw this, the first thing I thought of was, okay, well, is human ML 3D, is that actually the, the go-to benchmark for this, right? Because sometimes what these papers do is they will claim state-of-the-art, and the reason they claim state-of-the-art is because they find some random benchmark that nobody else uses, and then by using that random benchmark and beating that benchmark, they say, hey, we're the best, but it's really because they're just limiting to one specific. So I went on... Uh, this papers with code website here i really like this website because they have these benchmarks so you can basically go into computer vision for example here are classification here's all the different types of classification tasks we're specifically looking at motion generation i'm not gonna find it again but 
uh, motion synthesis. Here's seven different benchmarks for that, 11 different data sets. And here are all the benchmarks. So looking at these benchmarks, it does look like human ML3D is kind of the most popular one here. So, okay. I'm more comfortable with that, right? It seems like, okay, they're claiming state of the art, but it is on this human ML3D and human ML3D does seem to be one of the more popular benchmarks for motion generation. All right, if we click on it, we see that it is uh, using FID is the metric that you use, right? This is a distance metric, so lower is better. So over time, this goes down, right? So you can see people started using it in January 22 here, and then now January 2024, we're about here. And it seems like kind of the, the state of the art right now is about 0 0.045 of a score, and they're claiming uh, 0 0.473. So I think there's probably the the... the the, the order of magnitude here is wrong for a reason, but I think it might just be the way that the the way that it's noted here in uh, this, right? That doesn't seem necessarily correct because a score of 0 0.4 would put you right here, right? So that's a little sketchy here, right? Score of 0 0.47 is not is not the state of the art. The state of the art is 0 0.045. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. But because this is a Mamba model, they're of course gonna be very, very fast. So even if they don't necessarily get the best possible score quantitatively on this human ML3D data set, they're probably gonna be faster than the other models because these other models, these ones are all gonna be uh, either some kind of ConvNet or some kind of uh, attention based models, some kind of VIT, something like that, right? So they're probably going to be faster than all of these, but I don't know if they're necessarily better than those. Okay, but either way, they claim state of the art. Uh, and here's the summary of what they did. Okay. I guess they also, through experimental validation on the human ML3D and Kit ML, so let's actually see if Kit ML is also. Yeah, so there you go. So they are testing on the top two benchmarks. So here's the kit motion language. Kit motion language. And then currently the best one here is fine motion gem MMIT sitting at 0 0.115, 0 0.178, 0 0.2. Okay. We'll look at the exact scores later. Uh, all right. So the next thing I want to go into is a... Both of these papers have a summary of structured or just state-space models. So I think it's always good to, when you have two papers that use the same architecture like this, if you read both of these, you're gonna have a much better understanding because there's gonna be slight differences in the ways that they word these things. Maybe they use different uh, variable. So by kind of reading both of these, you, got, you get a much better understanding of exactly what is going on, right? Uh, Oh, the author's here. Okay, so one of you guys is actually the author. That's super interesting. <laughs> uh, wouldn't the height and width just be consistent opposed to the temporal? I don't know what you mean. Human ML3D is the most widely used text motion data set. Yeah, I I, I complimented you on that, Zeyu Zhang. Is Zeyu Zhang one of these guys? Oh, shit, it is. That is this guy. How's it going? Yeah, I complimented you on it, man. Like I, I did say that sometimes people use sketchy ben benchmarks, but you did not. You did use uh, the most popular benchmark, so positive points for that. Okay. So, actually, before we jump into this, let me... We, in the introduction section, right, both of these introduction sections largely give you the same story where, hey, transformers have this problem because they are have this quadratic complexity and therefore mambas do well because they have linear complexity. And I want to motivate that with this uh, YouTube video. This is a talk that Jeff Dean gave. Uh, Jeff Dean is kind of like a very famous programmer, kind of technical mind at Google. And he gave a talk here talking about the kind of history of machine learning. And he, this particular section I think here is quite good at motivating why uh, we even moved from state space or state space models to attention based models, right? So like at, 
at the beginning, all of these were state-space models. So for example, here in a 2014 paper, and look at this, this is a paper where Ilya Sutskever was the first author, right? So we usually think of Ilya as the last author, but there was a time when Ilya was just a, a young pup, you know, a, a, a researcher who was at the front of the paper, and this is actually one of the beginnings here. And here's the sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning, and he, I'm, the, the way that he says this is important, so I'm gonna be kind of um, basically uh, talking the captions here. So you can use a neural encoder over the sequence to initialize the state, which kind of gets you into the I've absorbed an input sequence and now I want to decode a word one at a time. So here he's talking about this idea, right, which continued into uh, this paper. So this is neural conversational models in 2015, where, which is, you could think of it like a variant of this state space where your previous, and then you can train, let me see, and get a good reply in the context, and it's the same model. It's a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model, but now the sequence is initialized with the context of all happened. And then you have to be effective, multi-pern, blah, 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 blah. A father came up with a model called the Transformers. I said this is a model, this is a recurrent model. Okay, here we go. This model is a recurrent model, so you have this, you have some state, and you take the next token, and you do some processing to get the new state, which you have to have absorb this token, and then you go on with that new state to absorb another token, then update the state again. So that's a very sequential process, right? So what Jeff Dean is talking about here is that all these state space models, they have this problem that in order to get the next state, you have to basically compute the previous state. In order to get the previous state, you have to compute the next state. It's like, it's autoregressive, but in a way that is kind of has to be done sequentially versus a transformer the way that he describes it is that you're moving from something in sequence to in parallel if we can do stuff in parallel we can just process a bunch of words and then we're going to attend it uh figure out how to attend to it so don't try to force state into a single recurrent distributed representation, which every single state space model does, right? Every single state space model is forcing the state. It's trying to compress all the information into this single recurrent uh, representation that you kind of keep passing forward and passing forward. Instead, when it, what an attention model or an attention mechanism is doing is it's saving all past representations and then attending to them. So fundamentally what the the shift was whenever you went from state space models to attention uh based models is that in attention based models you're saying okay well i don't know which of these uh attention uh operations where i have one part of the sequence paying attention to a different part of the sequence i don't know which one of those is going to be important and which one is not going to be important but i have this hardware here this gpu or this tpu that's very good at parallel computations so rather than uh trying to get good at basically compressing every single time and, and taking things out of that state, hidden state, and putting things into that hidden state and managing this uh, hidden state uh, over time, I'm just gonna compute all of the possible interactions, which is this attention mechanism, in parallel, and then I'm just gonna figure out which one of those are important and which one of those are not important. Right? So rather than trying to have a single state that we just update sequentially, we don't try to force that state into a, into a representation. Just save all the representations of all the tokens or words that you've seen and then make sense, figure out where to focus on those. Okay. So I don't know if that made any sense, but I suggest that you guys uh, listen to the way that he says it because he explains it much more clearly. But basically, we went from state-space models into attention-based models because the underlying intuition, the key intuition there is that I have computers which allow me to do things in parallel, so let me just compute the entire attention map in parallel and then figure out how to pull out the information that I want from there rather than having this hidden state that I just keep passing over and over and over to the next uh, state sequentially. <laughs> okay. I think everybody left. Everybody's like, what the fuck did this guy just try to explain? All right, now let's look at the actual math behind both of these. So we're gonna look at here. 
So states-based models are conceptualized based on a continuous system that maps a 1D function or sequence, so your one-dimensional function or sequence here, through a hidden state H. So this hidden state is basically all the information. You're compressing all the information that you have previously in time into this little hidden state of dimensionality N, right? Formally, SSMs employ the following ordinary differential equation. So an ODE is you just have this set of equations here that is basically saying that your input, X, which could be a video, frame here or it could be a uh, motion uh, a specific uh, joint angles right representing a specific keyframe in an animation that's going to be your input x input sequence and then you have the output sequence which in this case is going to be i don't know i don't exactly know some kind of video understanding output y of t and this equation allows you to get y of t from this h of t, which is this hidden state. So if I have this hidden state, I can multiply it by this c and I get the output. In order to get h prime, which is, you could think of it kind of like the derivative because this is a continuous system, then you just need the input, you multiply it by b, plus the previous hidden state, h of t, times a. So you need to basically keep calculating this h of t in order to get the next h of t, in order to get the next h of t, in order to get the next h of t, and then eventually you can get this y of t. And that's the same thing that's happening here. They have this uh, slightly different notation here where they have A, B, C, D, but it's basically the same thing here. Okay. Uh, X of T represents a continuous input signal and Y of T a continuous output signal. Okay, but the problem is that neither of these things are continuous, right? So whether it's video or these uh, motions, they're not continuous, right? The video is a discrete set of frames each, basically, it's a discrete sequence of frames, and these motions are also a discrete sequence of uh, keyframes or joint positions, right? So how are we going to take this equation here that is a, basically defined for a continuous system and turn it into a discrete system? So the continuous ODE is approximated through discretization, aka turning it into individual little uh, chunks. And the way that we do that is we're going to use this zero order hold method. So mention both of them here. Discretization process, notably using the zero order hold method. So the zero order hold method is actually very simple. This is the Wikipedia page for zero order hold method. And then I think this figure explains it the most clearly. So here you have uh, on the X axis, you have time. On the Y axis, you have some function over time, right? Some continuous function. So this gray line here represents some continuous function. And it's continuous in that you can keep zooming in. It has infinite resolution. But we need to turn it into a discrete function. A discrete function has a series of steps like this. And in order to do that, you use this zero order hold, which basically turns your continuous function, this gray line, into this piecewise constant signal. Right, so you've turned it now. You're basically saying, okay, well, here's the value that I got at this point in time. Here's the value that I got at this point in time. I'm just going to assume that for all the time in between step one and step two, it basically goes like, it's just flat. So you're basically turning this continuous function, this gray, into this piecewise flat, uh, piecewise linear flat. And that's the zero order hold method. So that's what they're doing here. They're turning this, this continuous thing here into this discretized thing here. So rather than an ODE where you're saying, here's the H of H uh, prime as a, as a function of H, now you're saying, okay, well, H T, the hidden state at time T is equal to this A bar times the hidden state at time T minus one times your input X. So once you have your input X, you get your initial hidden state, you get the next H of T. Then you do the same thing again for the next step and you get the next H of T. You can do the same thing for the next step, you get the next H of T and so on. Okay. Uh, this facilitates the computation of the output through global convolution, leveraging a structured convolutional kernel K bar, which encompasses the entire length M of the input sequence. Same thing kind of happening here. Contrary to traditional methods that rely on linear time invariant SSMs, Mamba distinguishes itself by implementing a selective scan mechanism as its score <laughs> core SSM operator. So SSM it's, is a state space model. And then I think S6 is selective scan structured selective scan state space model which i think there's a six s's is where that six s comes from but fundamentally you have the same thing here right you have these uh b is just a function of these matrices and this is the this is what you're actually going to be uh finding right so 
when you have a uh, a ConvNet, right, and the ConvNet has certain parameters, the parameters that you're describing there are, for example, the little weights in the kernels and the little weights in the linear layers at the end. When you have a Mamba model, the parameters are inside these variables here, in this inside this B, inside this A, and inside this C. So those are the actual variables that you're using, or the parameters in your model are basically the, the values of the numbers inside this n by n matrix A, this n by 1 matrix B, and this n by 1 matrix C. Where is H prime used after we compute it? Doesn't seem to be plugged into the next equation. This is a question from Jack E. So you don't actually use this H prime here, right? So this is, uh, ODE, which means that here is the equation, and then here is the basically H prime is like the derivative of H, right? But what we're saying is we're going to approximate this with a zero order hold method. So you're never actually doing this equation here. You're you're you are you're actually doing this equation here, right? So this is what you're actually doing because you've used this zero order hold method to basically take this continuous system and turn it into this discrete system. Right, so you're not you're never actually doing this. You're just doing this. Did that answer your question, Jack C? Is there a loss of data from the continuous function when converting it to Z O H? Probably, right? I bet you that if you increase the resolution at which you make this discrete, it'll be better and better and better. Right? So if you could have a higher frame rate video that would more closely approximate the continuous kind of system here, and it would probably ultimately be better. So there is probably some uh, dependency on the time resolution that you have, this time scale parameter delta here. Uh, where is it here? Step size, here they call it the step size delta, here they call it the time scale parameter delta, but basically what that delta is is this right here. It's like the difference between this sample here and this sample here, that's the delta. So you're kind of coming up with some delta there. Okay. All right. No more questions. Let's keep going. Uh, okay. Bidirectional SSM for vision. Uh, let's see if there's anything else here. Latent motion diffusion model. Okay. Now we read both of these sections for both of these papers because here it's the same paper or same section, right? The preliminary section where they describe what a state space model is, is going to be the same for both of these papers. But now we're going to have to describe the part that is different for both of these papers. And because both of these papers are using, are dealing with different modalities, this one's dealing with animations and this other one here or human motion generation, and this one's dealing with videos, they're going to have a different, uh, slightly different architectures to deal with that. And that's uh, this part here where they talk about the video mamba and this part here where they talk about the latent motion diffusion model. So these parts here are gonna be unique to the two different papers. So uh, question from Atharva, what PDF reader are you using and how do you manage reading list of all the papers? So, <laughs> I'm, I'm super distracted here. Apologies for being all over the place, but this is the repo. So if you go to my GitHub, I have this uh, public repo called Docs. And on this doc repo, if you go to the readme, these are my sources. So these are different websites that I use to basically find papers. There's a couple, uh, there's like Reddit, for example, here. I like this one. This is a new one that I found, Emergent Mind. This one's pretty nice. You can go here and you can go to categories. And you can also say, okay, well, I want the papers from this past week uh, ranked based on uh, how many uh, Twitter likes they had. And then there you go. This is the top paper this past week. And you can see how many Twitter likes it has, how many Reddit points it has, Hacker News points, how many YouTube videos it has. So this is one way I used to get papers. But there's a bunch of other kind of similar-ish sources here. So, for example, another popular source that people use all the time is this one here. So, Hugging Face has this daily papers. And basically, for every single day, this guy posts a bunch of papers, and then people can upvote, downvote. So, you can see 
kind of popular papers there. So usually what I do is on like Thursdays and Fridays, I'll sit down and then I'll just kind of go through all these different sources. I'll open them all up. I'll kind of scroll through all of them and I'll see, okay, what are the cool papers? And I don't necessarily just try to pick the one that is the most popular, you know, I try to kind of pick papers that are cool. And then sometimes if I see papers that are similar, such as this one where I saw the video Mamba and then I also saw... I don't know where the, where the motion mamba is, but if I see papers that are similar, then usually that actually motivates me. And I'm like, okay, well, if I can get both of these papers at the same time, then that's better than just one paper. So I don't know. I don't really have a super rigid process, to be honest. Uh, okay, let's look at this video mamba. So the video mamba first uses a three-dimensional convolution. So a two-dimensional convolution you can think of it like a convolution that goes over image space. Three-dimensional convolution just adds that extra third dimension of time, even though really it's four-dimensional because an image itself is already three-dimensional. So really, uh, there's four dimensions here, right? Because you have this three here, that's the channels, then you have the time, then you have the height and the width. So really, it's, a, it's 4D because images are already 3D, but we like to think of images as 3D or 2D, which means that if you add the time dimension, that makes it 3D. Okay. Into L, non-overlapping spatial temporal patches. So now you have little patches of, uh, you've reduced this T by H by W, you've kind of uh, patched that into L. So now you have L by C, where L equals T by H by W. The sequence of tokens input to the video Mamba encoder is this. So you have this extra class token here. X class is a learnable classification token that we prepend to the start of the sequence. Sometimes these are called attention sinks, and basically it's like an extra token that you put in there so that whenever you stack these blocks, uh, any additional information that might not be, that might be kind of more global information can be put into this little class token. But interestingly, you don't necessarily need that, and in this paper they actually get rid of it. So let me see if I can find that. Uh... See up here. God, I'm going to be bouncing everywhere here. Hmm. Okay. I'm not going to find it, but we'll find it eventually. I think in this paper, they don't actually use the class token. So potential difference between these. We also add learnable spatial position embeddings. So these are your uh, rope, for example. Rope rotary position embeddings, those are not learnable. Learnable position embeddings means that you're allowing gradients to go in there and that allows the actual final embedding to be the result of a learning process as opposed to a kind of heuristically human designed position embedding. So I actually prefer these learnable position embeddings and if you have some kind of weird modality like videos, I think learnable position embeddings is definitely better than rope or long rope or any of these kind of rope variants. Uh, Extra temporal position embedding as well. The tokens are passed through L stacked B Mamba blocks and the representation of the class token in the final layer is processed by normalization and linear layer for classification. Okay, so we know what the final output was. So this is a video understanding paper. So they're gonna be feeding in a video and then the output for this is gonna basically be a category. So ultimately what, what's gonna be coming out of this model is a uh, you're going to have a, a classification layer, which is just going to be, if there's 10 categories, you're going to have 10 final outputs. And those 10 final outputs are basically going to be the probability that this is category one, the probability that this is category two, and so on. right? And then you pick the one that has the highest probability, and then that's going to be your uh, classification output. Is not K and Q matrix in rope learnt? The rotational transformation is not, but the matrix is learnt. You're saying that, so rope doesn't have a K and a Q. K and Q are, you're talking about the, the key and the query, which are part of the attention head in an attention mechanism, right? The attention is where the key and the Q matrices are. Rope is just basically a, bunch of sinusoids that are all kind of stacked on top of each other. Okay. Spatial first. Okay. Scanning. Should we go into scanning? Let's look at the other one first though. This paper here. 
All right, so what are the special things that they do for the motion generation here? So they're gonna be using a latent diffusion, latent motion diffusion model. So diffusion models offer significant advancement in motion generation by gradually reducing noise from a Gaussian distribution to a target data distribution. So the Gaussian distribution is aka Gaussian noise, and then they wanna move that to the target data distribution. The target data distribution, we don't actually know what that is, but we have a bunch of samples from it, right? You can think of our data set as a, as a bunch of samples from this target data distribution. Uh, the T length here, refers to the fact that a diffusion model is going to uh, remove noise iteratively over a series of steps. So the length or the number of steps that you're going to be using to uh, use this denoiser iteratively is going to be T here. So XT is going to be, you're going to have X0, X1, X2, all the way to XT. And you can make that smaller and smaller and smaller or more. Generally, the more steps, the more precise it is. But there's a lot of techniques that people use to reduce the total uh, amount of steps you need here. You're going to have a denoiser. This denoiser consumes x of t and the specific time step. But usually, it's a little bit more complicated with that because usually what you want is this here. You want a conditional denoiser. So here is the kind of more generic ver version or for, uh, formula for the denoiser. But here is what you're actually going to be doing. So notice how the denoiser in this generic way is uh, consuming x of t, which is the input sequence. But that would just be a diffusion model. And we want a latent diffusion model. A latent diffusion model is instead going to consume this z of t. This z of t is the latent. So latent is basically a compressed uh, representation of that that should hopefully represent the full motion. So you take your full motion animation and you compress it into this little tiny latent and then that's what you're actually doing the diffusion in. And the way you compress it into that little latent is using a variational autoencoder. I should probably pull that up, VAE, even though you guys have seen these things like a million times. <laughs> but a VAE uses a reconstruction loss to, uh, let me click on that, control back, Let's open it big. Open image and new tab. There we go. So this little Z here is much smaller than this X. And the whole reason you do it, you do diffusion here in the Z is because if you did it in this X, it would just take too long. So you're training this encoder decoder that can take X, compress it down into the Z, and then can take that Z and shoot it back up into this X. Here it's done with images. So here you're doing it on MNIST images, but you can do this with anything, right? You can do a VAE on any kind of data. And in this one specifically, they do a VAE that is trained uh, minimizing the mean squared error between the true and the predicted noise in the latent space. And the VAE is going to have two pieces here, this encoder and this decoder, right? This encoder is going to be the E and then this decoder is going to be the D. So they're training an encoder, which takes your motion sequence from 1 to L encodes it into this latent space Z. That latent space Z is fed into this denoiser. This denoiser is conditioned on this uh, tau theta C. This tau theta C is a frozen text encoder. So some text encoder that somebody else trained. Uh, Clip is a very popular language image pre-training model that has encoders for both images and language, but here we're just going to be using the specific text encoder in Clip, which allows you to take some uh, sentence here. So this is a sentence, omega or W from 1 to N. You feed it into this text encoder, and it gives you a little vector of dimensionality 1 by D, and that little vector represents the information in that text, and then you're going to condition your denoiser on that, and you're going to apply that denoiser iteratively in this latent space of motions. And once you're done doing that, you're going to have some little latent motion, and then you're going to feed that into your decoder D, and out is going to come a f actual motion. And that's hopefully what you uh, wanted. How's it going, Amelie? <laughs> All right. Uh, Clip is so awesome, just keeps getting used. Yeah, there's a lot of different types of clips, so I don't actually know which clip this is. But clip, very powerful, definitely very popular. Mamba utilizes a denoising unit architecture. The denoiser comprises N blocks, including encoder 1 to N and decoder 1 to N. So 
what they're saying here is that this, this part here is the encoder, and then this part here is the decoder, right? So the encoder goes from being very wide to this little tiny representation, then goes from being very tiny all the way back to this wide top, right? And you're stacking a bunch of these blocks to create the encoder, and you're stacking a bunch of those blocks to create the uh, decoder. And there's also this transformer-based attention mixer block M right here. This middle, right, at the choke point, your, your mixer block is at that choke point because that's where your dimensionality is smallest. So if you want to have an attention mechanism that is very compute and memory intensive, you don't want to be doing that in the very wide part of your input when, you're, when your input data is very wide and kind of verbose. You want to do it when your uh, data is very compressed and small. So that's why you have this mixer here. And the mixer is where you actually uh, do this conditioning. Uh, okay, the encoder blocks are represented, arranged sequentially, and the decoders are configured in reverse order. Given that selective operations have significantly lower computational complexity compared to attention-based methods, we have increased the number of scans to achieve higher quality generation. A novel aspect of our model is the introduction of a hierarchical scan strategy. Okay, so now we've gotten to the same point in both of these where we're talking about scans. And what the fuck is a scan? So, if you remember from this Jeff Dean thing I was talking about here, right? Fundamentally, any state space model is performing a, is going through a sequence sequentially, right? So in language, the scan is very obvious, right? Language, you read it left to right, and you go from here to here to here to here to here to here to here. So it's a, there's only kind of one obvious scan direction in text. But uh, if you're dealing with more complicated data, such as motion data or video data, how do you scan that, right? There's a lot of different ways to scan. And here they have different scan methods for the video mamba. So you have here, this represents the spatial dimension, which is, you could think of it like the, uh, here's a better way to think about it. The spatial dimension would be this, the height and width of each frame, right? And then the time dimension is gonna be each frame consecutively. So if we go back here, what they call spatial first bidirectional scanning means that you go, you're go you going through the whole frame first and then you go to the next frame and then you go to the next frame and then you go to the next frame. So you're scanning in the spatial dimension first and then the time dimension, right? That's compared to temporal first bidirectional scanning where you're going through the time dimension first. So for every single little patch in your frame, you're going through the whole video and then you go to the next patch and then go through the whole video and then go to the next patch and then go through your whole video. So that would be temporal first. This bi-directional here refers to the fact that you're gonna be scanning both ways. So you're gonna start from the very first frame of the video, going all the way to the end of the video, and you're also gonna start from the very end of the video and go all the way to the first frame of the video. And this is actually an old trick that people did uh, back in the day with, for example, bi-directional LSTM. So LSTMs is a kind of an older type of state-space model, but in an LSTM, or in a bi-directional LSTM, you're going through the sentence in two different directions. You're going through it this way, and you're also going it through the opposite reverse way, right? So two different directions. So this is basically the same thing. You have bi-directional, so you're going from the very last patch of the very last frame of the video all the way to the very first patch of the very first frame of the video. And there's a bunch of these different scan directions. The Mamba ND has a clear explanation of the scanning strategy. So, in here, they they actually this is a little bit more complicated though because here you're you're all, you have a sequence of frames and you're basically choosing which direction do I scan, which dimension do I scan first, and am I scanning in both uh, ways? So here, spatial temporal scanning B two, but. This paper here does something tricky, where they're gonna change the number of scans depending on where you are in this hierarchy of the encoder-decoder, right? So you see how the encoder and the decoder, there's different numbers of these blocks, right? You see there's different blocks of encoder, different blocks of decoder. And the intuition here is that those blocks are representing slightly different things, right? So I have here pulled up a visualization of what 
the representations at different levels of a ConvNet look like, right? So, right, this is not 100% correct here. This Down here, you're just seeing like a multi-layer perceptron. It, this is not actually what the features look like. These are ConvNet features, and this is like a MLP. But the important thing to understand here is that when you're close to the image or your input space, the features at the lower levels, right, are going to be things that are like edges or, or textures or things like that, right? Very low low level sometimes called high frequency details, right? So at the lower levels of your encoder or at the higher levels of your decoder, you're gonna be dealing with things that look like this, right? As you move up, the features get more and more abstract. So you see how you go from edges to now you're going to eyes, noses, mouths, things like that. And then at the highest level, you're going to like full faces, right? So the authors in this paper basically intuitively realized that the number of scans allocated to each layer should probably change depending on where you are in this hierarchy, right? So like when you're here at the higher level of the hierarchy or the more compressed form of your representation or the more semantic kind of high level features, you should scan not as many times as at the lower level. So you see how the number of the number of scans at the lower level here is 2 by n minus 1 and when you go all the way to the top is s1. So they change the number of these scans depending on where you are in this hierarchy. <laughs> Was that a good summary say you? I think it's a cool little trick but I don't know I feel like it's a little complex <laughs> right <laughs> i don't know the hierarchical scanning ensures that processing capabilities are evenly distributed through the encoder decoder architecture fac facilitating a detailed and nuanced analysis of temporal sequences we can rewatch this <laughs> I, i'm not even going to rewatch this dog uh the hierarchical temporal block compress latent representations T signifies the temporal dimension. Our analysis revealed that increasing the density of motion within lower level featured spaces. So my kind of intuition here is that if you think about this encoder that's compressing this motion, right? At the at the lower levels, it's gonna be there's gonna be a lot more movement, right? Because the lower levels are trying to capture these like lower level features like the exact motion of like a, an ankle or a knee or an elbow, right? So like over the course of this motion, the elbow might go up and then down and then up and then down. So like the, the amount of like, you can think of it movement or just kind of like change at the lower levels of this hierarchy, it's going to be much higher versus once you go higher into the higher and higher levels of this hierarchy, it's going to be less I feel like it's going to be more consistent, right? So the way to think about it is that at the lower level, it's like, here's the position of the elbow. Here's the position of the elbow. Here's the position of the elbow. Here's the position. So, but once you go higher and higher and higher at the highest level, it's almost more like a, a, a summary of everything, right? At that point, you're almost looking at like a global feature that is saying, Hey, here is dancing or this is walking, right? So that's, that's the kind of reasoning that I feel like I do in my head. But our analysis revealed an increased density of motion within the lower level feature spaces. Consequently, we developed a hierarchical scanning method that is executed at various depths of the network, not only accommodating the diverse motion densities, but also significantly reduces computational overhead. I guess because you're saving on compute in these final layers here, you don't do as much scanning. After executing a sequence of scans, this collection is subsequently aggregated via a linear projection to obtain the final output of the HTM block. So that's the scanning. Let's see if there's anything else on scanning here. Uh, the spatial first, so here are all the different types of scanning. They describe it, organizing the spatial tokens by location and then stacking them frame by frame. Our experiments demonstrate that the spatial first bidirectional scan is the most effective yet simple, which is great. You love to see it when the simplest strategy works the best. So spatial first, then bidirectional, which means that you're trying to understand the entire frame 
before you go frame to frame, right? So the Mamba is basically going through every single uh, patch in each frame, and then it goes to the next frame, and it goes through every single patch, and then it goes to the next frame, and it goes through every single patch. So if you think about why maybe that works, right? So if we go into this, right? Let's uh, zoom in a little bit. So you're you're because this is a state-based model, you're fundamentally carrying through this uh, hidden state, right? You're 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 going through this hidden state one H at a time, right? So as you're going from here to here, you have a little H. Now you have a little H. Now you have a little H. So when you're here, the H is representing all of this part. When you're here, the H is representing all of this part. So now once you get to this next frame, the little H of T, that hidden state, is basically supposedly representing this entire frame, right? So that's a completely different idea than if you went temporally first. If you went temporally first, your H would go from here to here to here, and then it would go from here to here, or from here to here to here. So at that point, your H is probably just more confused, right? If you think about like the type of information that's being packed into that hidden state, it's like the, the top corner of the video, and then the, the slightly less top corner of the video, and then the slightly less top corner of the video, right? And just intuitively using my kind of monkey brain, it feels like it makes a lot more sense that you would basically summarize the entire frame and then move to the next frame rather than trying to summarize each individual part of the video. But I also think that that depends on the video, right? Because you can imagine, for example, a video that is like a static camera that's just like staring at like a... Uh, maybe it's staring at like an airport terminal, right? So if you have a static camera staring at an airport terminal and you have people walking back and forth, then maybe the time first scanning would actually work better because in that case, you're summarizing that top corner, right? Nothing's happening in that top corner. So then by the time you get to the second part, maybe the, a little bit closer to the center of the image, your hidden state can just forget that entire top part of the corner because it doesn't need to remember that top part of the corner because nothing's happening in that top part of the corner. So even though here they do mention that they got best results with the spatial first bidirectional scanning, I feel like it, there's probably a little bit of bias there where depending on the data set, spatial verse versus temporal first might actually be better. So I don't know. I can, I can make intuitive sense in my head as to why temporal first or spatial first would be better. So I don't know, that's just my opinion. I feel like this is probably the, the better way to do it is just to have both of them have no inductive bias, right? Rather than using this, which is an inductive bias, use this, which is just no inductive bias because you're doing it both ways and then see what happens. But this is obviously more compute. And if you're trying to save on compute, then you don't need to do it. Uh, okay. Streamlines the architecture by omitting features such as the middle class token and the rope. So I guess they don't have a class token in between these frames. I don't know what they mean by middle class token. Different masking strategies. Bidirectional scanning. Okay, bidirectional scanning of the latent channel dimension. So I think that pretty much went through it. Enhancing latent representation through a novel approach. Dimension rearrangement. So here you have channels. B is probably batch, and then T is time. Swapping the temporal and channel dimension undergoes linear projection, resulting in dimension X. Each X prime is then linearly projected. This component is engineered to decode the structured latent skeleton by analyzing the data from both forward and reverse viewpoints. Its main objective is to ensure that the seamless continuity of information flow, thereby substantially enhancing the model's ability to generate accurate motion. This is achieved through the maintenance of a dense information exchange, which is critical for the model's performance. So if we actually go to the figure here, this is the BSM block, which is this front part here. And this front part here is scanning through the uh, spatial dimension. In this, the spatial dimension basically means it's going through all the frames first. So it's going through like all the joints. And then, so it's going from head to toe, and then it's going from toe to head and that's bi-directional scanning in the spatial dimension for this modality. So you see how it does it in both dimensions? 
and then it does this uh, uh, hierarchical temporal block, which is now looking at the whole time dimension. And it's doing that fancy trick where it's looking at the more compressed high-level versions less than the more uncompressed lower-level versions. And then you stack a bunch of these times n. Here's your little residual connection going around. Skipping these blocks so that you give a path for the gradient to flow. Right, These residual connections uh, in originally intended to solve the vanishing gradient problem. They just give an extra little pathway for the gradient to flow so you can train these faster. Okay. I think that's pretty much it on the scanning. Now we go into the actual, uh, maybe one more trick here. So the video Mamba paper, they do this, they actually do have like kind of a complicated way of training. So one thing that they do is they do this masked training. So in masked training, you're masking out part of the data when you're feeding it into your model. So when your model is receiving this data, it's not receiving all of the data. Sometimes it's basically receiving zero. So these red squares means that whenever you're feeding this into your model, you're actually basically zeroing that out. So this is kind of like a type of self-supervised self learning where you, you are saying, okay, well, or a type of regularization as well, where you're basically saying, I'm going to feed you the video and you're going to produce ultimately this classification into one of 10 categories or however many categories there are. If I feed you the video, but I randomly cut out parts of the video, you should still be able to give me the correct category. And it forces the model to not necessarily pay too much attention to any part of the stuff. It forces it to kind of pay attention to all of it. Uh, okay, but there's a bunch of different strategies for masking here. And I was like, you know what? I wonder if I can copy paste this into ChatGPT and Claude. Question from Akdad, how do they embed patch information for each frame? Embed patch information for each frame. So each, if you go here in this part here, this is how they do it. So they have the input video and they use a 3D convolution, you can think of it as a basically cutting up the video into these little patches, right? So now you have this, spatiotemporal patches, R, L by C. So that's how they're cutting it up. So this is the raw video, and this is how they turn it into these patches. Does that make sense, Akon? But anyways, so we were looking at the different masking strategies that they use in this video paper, and I copy-pasted this into ChatGPT4 and then Claude. And I was like, provide a short explanation for each of these types of masking. So here we go. We're going to compare these types of masking. So input video, random masking. Random masking, obviously pretty self-explanatory, but let's look at the more complicated one. So tube masking. This technique involves masking continuous tube-like regions across several frames. This helps temporal modeling since the same region is masked over multiple frames. Tube masking. Max out 3D tubes, cuboids of frames, both spatially and temporally. I actually kind of like this definition more because what's happening in tube masking is note that the same patch in every frame is being masked over the entire sequence. So you see this, this top corner here is masked the entire time. This, these two here are always masked. So you're masking the same spatial position over the entire video. So it's kind of like a tube that is going through the whole time dimension. That's the way to, that's why it's called tube masking. So I feel like this one made the more sense because it kind of talks about this tube-like region. All right, clip row masking and frame row masking. This strategy masks entire rows of pixels across all frames of the video. It's akin to having a horizontal strip that is consistent along the sequence of frames. Let's see what Claude says. Masks out entire rows and strips of frames that span the full temporal duration of the video clip. Clip row masking. That's not really what's going on here, right? This is, this is masking out this uh, row, but it's not the temporal, like th this row is here in this frame, but not here in this frame. So like, it's not masking out the same 
spatial area over the entire time, which is what tube masking is. So I don't think either of these are necessarily actually correct. Masks out row strips within individual frames. Each frame is masked separately. Uh, frame row masking, similar to clip row masking, but instead of the entire clip, each frame has its rows masked individually. This means that the masked rows can vary from one frame to the next. That seems more correct, right? Here you have different, the row is masked out here, masked out here, but then not masked out here. So I, th I don't know, I'm, I'm equally confused. I actually don't honestly know what the fuck frame row masking versus clip row masking. It's kind of difficult to like see what the hell is going on here. And their definition isn't, isn't very uh, good either. The difference between clip row and frame row is that the former masks the entire video clip while the latter masks each frame individually. I th like I'm honestly thinking that maybe this is just like an incorrect figure because this is not the entire video clip. Like, th this is not consistent in the time dimension. I don't know. Because according to this definition, right, clip row should almost look like tube masking. It should basically be like tube masking, but for rows. So I don't know what's going on with this. But then attention masking, this one here, and they actually do define it later, so we can compare the attention masking definition that they have uh, here in the paper, attention masking at the very bottom. Attention masking stands out as the most efficient by favoring the preservation of adjacent meaningful content. So it seems like basically the attention masking, what it tries to do is it tries to keep, uh, it doesn't try to mask out entire things and it tries to basically have enough adjacent patches that you could, you can, you have something that's like, uh, locally kind of near the other patch, right? That's the way that I kind of understood it. So let's see what uh, GPT and Claude say. Attention masking. This type of mask is designed for a specific model to process video model enhances performance by directing the model's attention to unmasked areas. So this is incorrect. There's no attention mechanism here. This is, so it's, it's like it automatically just assumed that this is some kind of like attention-based model, but it's not, it's a Mamba. Unlike clip row, which masks the same rows around across the entire clip, attention masking might vary the pattern from frame to frame to improve the focus on different parts of the video. So I don't think this is what attention masking is, but okay, let's see if Claude got it. Masks out regions based on attention, likely focusing on salient objects or region. I don't think this is it either, right? Because it's not, what, it, what saliency would be, would be that if you did uh, the attention mechanism, and you put this through a VIT, and then you went and said, okay, well, which parts of the frame were multi four are as confused as I am about what these three types of masking right here are. Temporal position and spatial position, PT. Okay. Okay, so... The masking that was done by the video model or video mamba, but then this is the weirdest part of the paper. So in the in the in this video mamba paper, they do this extremely weird shit here. They do self distillation, which uses a smaller and well trained model as the teacher to guide the training of the larger student model. And this is I feel like this is the first time I've ever seen this. So whenever I see the word distillation, usually what I mean is a what what that means is that you're taking a bigger model that has been trained and you're distilling a smaller model from it. So you're taking a big model and then you're and that's going to be the teacher and then you have a small model which you're going to call the student and then you train the small model to basically mimic the output of the big model. And in that way you distill or make it smaller, right? Because distillation comes from this process of distilling alcohol where you're taking a large volume of water that is low percent alcohol and then distilling it into a small volume that has a higher percent alcohol, right? But here they do it the opposite way, which is really weird. They have a big student and a small teacher. So they basically train a tiny mamba and then when they train the slightly bigger mamba, they're training it to mimic the small mamba. So the reason this is weird 
is because this will cause overfitting, right? So the, the, whenever you have a model that is small, it has small capacity. Whenever you have a model that is big, it has big capacity. If you have a big model and a small data set, then the big model will just overfit on the small data set, right? It'll basically memorize that small data set. So if you're training a big student on a small teacher, you're just overfitting on that small teacher uh, it just it just is weird but they get better <laughs> it leads to better convergence so i don't exactly know what the fuck is going on here it seems like it should not work but somehow that works i don't know fucking weird i think the the way the reason this works is that this isn't the entire process i think that this distillation process is combined with this uh uh masked kind of self self supervision type approach so that the combination of both of those losses results in a better convergence so it's not like you're doing like pure distillation you're you're combining it with this masking and you're combining it with uh the actual classification loss from the actual data set and all three of those combined work better with the distillation than without the distillation but i thought this was really weird and I want, and it made me wonder if this works for other types of models, right? Like, could you do this for other types of models? Like, when you're training a, a big language model and you're training it just autoregressively to predict tokens, right? Could you also add an additional loss where it tries to mimic the logits of a smaller model? Like, that doesn't seem like it would work, right? If you took a 70B llama and you're trying to train this 70B llama, would you also say, okay, well, not only am I going to use the loss, whatever your standard autoregressive token prediction loss that you use for your 70B llama, but I'm also going to have it try to match the logits of a 7B llama? Like, how, how is that going to work better? I don't, I don't know. That was really, that was weird to me that this works, but it somehow works. Yeah, so Zayu also kind of agrees with me. Strong augmentation to student and feed weak augmentation to the teacher. So uh, Zayu saying weak and strong. So he's talking about uh, the level of augmentation. So strong augmentation would be you have a lot of masking, right? So if you're provide in, for example, when you're feeding images into a model that consumes images, you usually augment the images, which means you're messing with the images, right? You're cutting out parts of the image, you're fuzzing the images, you're rotating the images. So strong augmentation means you're rotating them a lot, you're cropping them a lot, you're messing with them a lot. Weak augmentation, in the case of image augmentation, would be you're just barely rotating them. You're just barely cutting out a couple of patches. So in this case, Zayu saying strong augmentation would be you, you basically mask out huge chunks of the video versus weak augmentation. You just mask out a little bit of the video. But yeah. But yeah, it is weird. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not alone because I, I saw this and I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> but Okay. Uh, firstly, Video Mamba is trained from scratch on video data alone, aligning unmasked tokens with those from Clip VIT. So, aligning us unmasked tokens with those from Clip VIT. So it's basically trying to match the tokens, which are these little patches or what's whatever's coming out of those, with the Clip VIT. So it's in a sense, it's kind of distilling Clip VIT. So the first thing it does is it tries to basically mimic this Clip Vision Transformer. So whatever knowledge this clip vision transformer has gotten, you're trying to distill that. So that's the first part, trained from scratch. So you're training it from scratch and you're gonna basically distill it from this clip VIT. Then you're gonna snap on this text encoder, which is gonna be a BERT, which actually seems kind of weak. I feel like they should have just used the same text encoder that they put in this clip. Like why, why would they use a BERT? And then that's when you do your image text, video text data sets. So there's like kind of a multi-step training process here, including this weird distillation. 
It's important to note that distinction from UMT, which employs multi-layer alignment between the student and teacher models, multi-layer alignment between student and teachers, this is distillation where you're not just distilling the very last final layer and saying, okay, the last output of the student should match the last output of the teacher, but you actually do it at multiple layers. So you're saying not only should the last layer of the student match the last layer of the teacher, but in the middle layer of the student should also match the middle layer of the teacher. So you're kind of like distilling the entire hierarchy. We align only the final outputs. Regarding our masking, we propose different row masking techniques, blah, 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 blah. Okay, and then we finally get to the experiments. Okay, and then this is the experiment section for this one. All right, so the Motion Mamba paper is going to be using human, M human ML3D and Kit ML. Human ML3D is 14,000 motions. Kit ML is about 3,000 motions. And these are pretty small, right? Like, when you think about it, the data sets for motion generation, like, they're not even in the 100,000s. Like, we're not even talking, like, a data set with a million instances. We're talking, like, 15,000. So I can actually, the same way that, for example, a lot of the 3D uh, 3D stuff is trained using stable diffusion as a generator, right? So stable diffusion created a generative image model that you can use to generate images given a piece of text. And a lot of people treat those as basically data generators. So you can think of a trained model as a, as kind of like a data set, right? So you can f create, use an LLM to feed a bunch of text prompts into a stable diffusion model to create a giant data set of images and text. And then you can do something with that, right? So I actually think there's gonna be a similar situation here where these data sets here are very small, right? 14,000, 4,000. So I feel like someone's gonna take a generative model such as this Motion Mamba and then use a language model to feed a bunch of text into it and then get a bunch of animations out of it, and then someone's gonna basically create a data set that someone else will be able to use to train a different generative motion model. So that seems like a potential next step uh, is if you use this trained motion, generative motion model as kind of a data set generator, and you get a data set that's 10 times or 100 times bigger than these data sets, could you figure out some kind of like data flywheel there to tr train something even better? I don't know. I think that's an interesting, interesting direction to go down. Do we, can we actually see? So what does human ML3D, can we like actually see what this looks like? Human ML3D data set. Here we go. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Waving with their left hand, shaking their left hand, waves their left hand. Okay, so for every single sequence of uh, joint positions or motion, you have three different text descriptions. And you can probably do the same trick that they do. So another trick that people do all the time now is that they'll feed this text description into a language model and they'll augment it. So they'll basically get the language model to make this into like a little paragraph. So rather than this being just a single sentence, it'll be like a paragraph. And then that gives it a more nuanced kind of like conditioning signal. So you could probably do that as well, right? Augment the text descriptions of this human ML3D data set. Uh, paired for both data sets, the pose representation adopted is derived from T2M. Okay, so what they're talking about here is that fundamentally these motions are very specific uh, format, right? So the armature or the skeleton behind this is very specific and there's lots of different types of armatures and skeletons, right? So like, for example, some armatures and skeletons have all the fingers and they have slightly different uh, configurations for the elbows and the, and the shoulders that have like a, a shoulder rotation and stuff like that. There's a lot of different types of skeletons that people use when animating or creating these animations. So <laughs> you can run into the situation where different data sets have different 
armatures or skeletons, and then it's a huge pain to basically retarget and put them all into one common format. So luckily here, I think that both of these have the same pose representation or skeleton. Okay, let's look at these results. So these are the human ML3D, and this is the kit ML results. Okay, so they compare to MLD, motion diffuse, MDM. Can we see those here? Leaderboard. MLD, motion diffuse, remo diffuse. <laughs> is diverse motion the same thing as motion diffuse? MLD, dude, none of these even match. This is the problem with, oh, here we go. MLD and motion diffuse. Okay, so MLD gets a score of 0.473. Is that the same? MLD gets a score of points. Okay, good. You love to see that. You want to see that match. If it doesn't match, there's an issue, but at least we're matching. And then MDM gets a score of 0.54. MDM 0.54. That's correct. Okay, but... <laughs> Yeah, I was I was going to talk shit, but since you're here watching the video, I'm not going to talk shit, but 0 0.28 is not technically state-of-the-art because 0 0.28 basically puts you right above this guy here, FG2M, but these are more modern papers. So usually what happens is that when you're doing the work for this paper, these other papers aren't even out, right? So you're only going to be able to compare against all the stuff that was there before your work even came out. But then when your work comes out and you claim state of the art, other people also publish their work and they might even, they might beat your score. So even though this is state of the art compared to the previous methods, these methods are already kind of outdated a little bit, but it is better than MM, MLD and motion diffuse. And then let's see for Kit ML, can we get the same thing here? So let's go to motion synthesis and then kit motion language and then MLD, here we go, 0.4 FID. MLD, we got FID 0.4, that's correct. All right, so 0 0.307 for this motion mamba gets us roughly about here. So it's like number four. It's somewhere in between these two. But here's the real situation is that this metric is kind of bullshit anyways. FID is like kind of a bullshit metric. Like really you would want to use human evaluator studies, but you know, if you're in an academic research group, you don't have the type of money to do these human evaluation studies. So I guess FID is the best you got. So not quite state of the art, but I guess good. It's good. It's a good work, say you. Don't worry. I respect you because you're a researcher. I respect all researchers. When I talk shit, it's coming from a place of love. Yeah. Uh, okay. So they also create this variant. So human ML3D LS is human ML3D, but long sequence, I think is what the LS stands for. Dataset exhibits a long-tailed and a right-skewed distribution with a significant proportion of long-sequence human motion. So what they're saying here is that if you actually look at uh, this data set, this ML3D data set, there's a lot of animations that are longer than 200 frames, I guess. So they're going to specifically create a subset of the data set where uh, all sequences longer than 190 frames and then see if those... Uh, you get better results comparatively. And this doesn't exist on uh, on papers with code. So you should put it on papers with code, man. Say you, you could put it here, right? Add it to this. But not only is it gonna potentially be better quality-wise, but it's definitely gonna be better uh, performance-wise, right? Because kind of the biggest advantage of these Mamba models is the speed and if comp computational efficiency, right? Because you're not doing that quadratic complexity attention mechanism for the longer the sequence is, 
the better your performance is going to be compared to attentions comparatively, right? So the any attention-based method, if you have this long-ass sequence, the performance is going to be terrible, right? Like so, the actual like uh, inference time is going to be bad. So here, not only are they beating these other ones in terms of these quantitative metrics here, like quality metrics, but if they were to actually compare the inference time, it would it would be really good as well. So that's the benefit of the Mamba models is that like as as the dimensionality of our data gets bigger and we're dealing with longer and longer videos and and uh, more higher image resolution, right? Because the the bigger the image resolution, it's kind of like a longer sequence, right? Imagine if you cut if you had a 4K image that was cut into thousands of patches as opposed to this uh, tiny little image here cut into a 4x4 four four patches, right? So as we get l larger and larger image resolutions and we get longer and longer videos, the Mamba models are going to be better and better and better as an option because they just don't have that quadratic scaling. So there's kind of almost like an arms race here, right? Where in one future, the GPUs get so, get so much better, so much faster that it doesn't matter, right? So let's say that NVIDIA has their H100s and the next year they have their Z1000s or something like that, right? If the Z1000s are a thousand times more powerful than the H100s, and I made that up. I don't actually know what the Z, the Z1000 is a made up GPU that I just created. Don't actually quote me on that. But if the GPUs get a lot better, a lot faster, then it doesn't matter if you have quadratic complexity, right? But if the GPUs don't actually scale that much better, right? If the GPUs just get a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better, then we're gonna have to figure out how to, how to not get crippled by this attention uh, mechanism and its quadratic complexity. So the success of these Mamba models compared to transformers almost depends more on how many 10 X's in terms of GPU performance are we going to get? If the GPUs get good really fast and you 10 X hundred X over the next couple years, then these Mamba models don't matter because everybody's just going to be using transformers because nobody cares about the quadratic complexity. But if the GPUs kind of stall and they don't really get that much better, then we're going to have to f use these Mamba models in order to uh, have deal with the increasing uh, dimensionality of our input data. Right? And that is also the case here, right? So in here, you're dealing with these motion sequences, right? But imagine the dimensionality of this is going to increase, right? So here, this data set there's no hands, right? If you look at the hands, the hands are always like this because there's no skeleton in the hands, right? But next year, we're probably going to want hands, right? And then the shoulder, we're going to want all the rotations of the shoulder. So the dimensionality of the armature skeletons that you have in these motion models is also going to increase. And the resolution at which you sample them is also going to increase. So much like the videos are going to get uh, the sequence length of videos is going to get longer because the spatial and the temporal dimension is going to get higher. You're going to have 4K video at 120 frames per second. The same thing's going to happen here. You're going to have many more bones, which are the uh, basically the number of joints inside that skeleton, and you're going to have a much higher sampling frequency. So the dimensionality of both of these types of data modalities is going to increase, and unless the GPUs get faster, the the Mamba models might just win because they don't have that quadratic complexity. And they seem to be working quite well based on these papers, right? No hands, only hand joints, AKA wrist joints. The inference is in the next section, okay. So you're saying, here we go, here's the inference time. So yeah, this is, you should have put this higher up. You know, like this is the best part, you know, like it's a Mamba paper, so your inference time is gonna be where you kind of blow everything out of the water. You should have put this section up here, right? Maybe maybe up at the top of the results right here, something like that. Just because like you start off with this quality metrics, but I don't know, maybe it doesn't really matter, you know, like how many people are even reading these papers, but okay, let's see. Inference time remains significant challenge for diffusion-based methods. I think I think you meant. Uh, okay, I guess you're saying here diffusion diffusion based methods are doing it iter iteratively denoising. Therefore, 
if you require 10 steps of iterative denoising, then your inference time is pretty gnarly because you're going to have to do it 10 times. Average inference time of 0 0.217 seconds. I don't actually know whether that's good or bad. I don't really have a notion of how good that is. I guess here we go. Average inference time. So motion diffuse and MDM, which are the two other ones that were state of the art here, motion diffuse and MDM, much more inference time for the same FID that you get with Motion Mamba. So Motion Mamba is not only the best FID, even though it's not, because we just saw on this benchmark that it's technically not the best, but pretty good FID for a much, much faster inference time. All right, let's look at the results here. Uh, Self-distillation avoids overfitting. I think this is weird because distilling a larger teacher from a, or a larger student from a smaller teacher is like, should be the definition of overfitting. So the fact that this helps is kind of weird. But uh, this one, they're gonna be doing experiments on ImageNet 1K. When trained from scratch, the big model tends to overfit easily and underperforms compared to Video Mamba S. Mm, so this might be why the distillation works is that the data set is small. Okay, so now, now this actually makes sense. Okay, so the reason that distilling from the small model to the big model works in the case here is because if you just try to train the big model from scratch on this data set, which is kind of small, it'll overfit. Versus if you train the small model on this data set, it doesn't overfit because the model's already small. So the features in the small model are better features because they're actually trying to generalize as opposed to overfitting. So it's still not a good idea because then fundamentally what you're doing is you're basically saying, okay, this small model, the general features that this small model used because the data set was also small, they're better than the features that you would get if you just overfit a big data set. So let's just overfit a big model on the, on the small features that we got from the small data set and the small model. It just doesn't seem like a good idea, but it makes sense that you would get better performance by doing this just because they're training this from scratch. But I think the answer to this is don't use this distillation bullshit. Just get 10 times more data and then your, your big video mamba won't overfit. That would be my conclusion there. Okay, conv next. So they're gonna compare to some conv nets here. This is image net classification, which is kind of like a not super interesting anyways, but here's a transformer based model, conv net based model, and then the SSM Mamba. It's not, it's not, it's about the same. It's a little bit better. CNN, number of parameters, 87, 87, it's about the same size too, okay. Okay, I was about to say, why is this so much bigger, 83, but it's because this image resolution is higher, so it's more, this is not actually the one you wanna be comparing against, you wanna be comparing against this one here. Three, 224, let's get rid of this. So we wanna compare the same image resolution. So we got 224, number of parameters 87, the transformer slightly more flops. This is floating point operations, kind of like an idea of compute complexity. Gets a slightly lower score than the ConvNet, but ImageNet is kind of like a little bit bogus. You have Video Mamba M, 224, 74, so slightly less parameters. 12, right? The Mamba is very efficient, so that's why it has the lowest flops. And then a score of 82, which is kind of in be the best out of all of them. Nice. So there you go. That's 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 state of the art. Less flops, better performance. Okay. Then they're going to evaluate on Kinetics 400 and something something V2. These are videos of 10 seconds and 4 seconds. This is the action classification. So action classification, Kinetics 400 is seemingly the most uh, popular one. Let's look at what that looks like. Kinetics 400 looks like this. So you're classifying a video into, I guess, 400 different categories. So here the categories are things like stretching legs, tickling, salsa dancing, 
shaking hands. Dude, this tickling category, <laughs> this, this looks like sex. Like, what the fuck? Robot dancing. Okay, so you're basically classifying 10 second videos into 400 human action classes. And the current state of the art is intern video here which is about 91% accuracy at one. So accuracy at five means the correct category is in the top five. Accuracy at one means the correct category is exactly the one that has the highest uh, probability or the highest kind of log it. Extra data, K400 top one. Here it is, 83 for the largest. So this is the largest video Mamba. 83, extra data under supervised training versus self-supervised. This is the using the, the masked and then the clip distillation, 85. What is that? Dude, 85 is not even close. It's all the way down here, holy shit. <laughs> Damn, dude. 85 is like not even close to state of the art. What are they talking about? 85 is like the scores that people were getting in like 2021. Dude, what the fuck? Oh, this is, wait up. Accuracy at one, accuracy at five. Which one do we want to do? Let's do accuracy at five. Accuracy at five, the current top is at 98. Accuracy at five, the current top here, they have 96. That's a little bit closer. UMT video B800, is that even close? UMT, okay, so here we go, at least this one. UMTL gets an accuracy at five of 98. UMT B, so they didn't include UMT-L, which I guess is probably the big version of this, UMT-Large and then UMT-Base. So they only compare against this one, which gets a score of 97. UMT-Base, that's, that's a little sketchy, right? Because UMT-Base is smaller than UMT-L. UMT-L gets the state-of-the-art 98 but they're comparing to this smaller one here, UMTB, which still beats their model. Okay, so there's some fuckery going on in here with the state of the art. I don't think they explicitly say state of the art. Sets a new benchmark for video understanding. Okay, so they don't say state of the art, which is good. If they would have said state of the art, that would have been disingenuous, but what does setting a new benchmark mean? I guess it's just the best out of all the Mamba models. It's a little sketch. Uh, they do some ablation studies here. High resolution does not uniformly lead to better performance. That's just because these data sets are kind of bogus, right? Kinetics 400, ImageNet, any kind of classification task like that, you don't even necessarily, like as soon as you see high resolution does not lead to better performance, it means the task is kind of bogus. But ImageNet and Kinetics 400 kind of seem a little bogus anyway, so. The benchmarks are not good. An optimal masking ratio of 80%, which is very strong. Row masking is the most efficient. All right, let's get to this conclusion here. We're almost at the end. All right, let's read the conclusion for the video one first, and then let's read the conclusion for the motion generation one. Uh, in this paper, we propose Video Mamba, a purely state space model based model for efficient video understanding. Our extensive experiments demonstrate its scalability in the visual domain, sensitivity for short term action recognition and superiority in long term video understanding. We hope they can pave the path for future model design for long video comprehension. I mean, there's a lot wrong here. It's, they don't really demonstrate the scalability because as they say here, we haven't fully validated the scalability. They also don't demonstrate the superiority because they get beat out by these uh, transformers here. 
Oh, it's not looking good, guys. Uh, incorporating additional modalities. We hope you can pave the way. Integrating with large for our level video understanding. This is where I feel like they should have gone. Like, you know, if you're doing a video Mamba paper, the benefit, you're, you're, don't compare to transformers on these type of benchmarks because these type of benchmarks, these data sets are very small, like 10 second videos, the resolution is very small. You're gonna get beat by the transformers on these, right? What you should have done is find some kind of video task where the length of the video is a lot longer, the resolution of the image is a lot bigger, and then just beat the transformers on inference speed. Right, but they kind of tried to beat the Transformers in their own game here, and that's why they lost. Uh, our findings confirm Video Mamba's promising potential, and we plan to conduct thorough explorations of its capabilities in the future. Okay. Let's look at John. In the study, we introduced Motion Mamba, a novel framework designed for efficient and extended sequence motion generation. All right, so this is the right idea. You know, if you have a Mamba paper, do what's good for the Mamba papers, efficiency and long sequences. Our approach represents the in inaugural integration of the Mamba model within the domain of motion generation. They have these two different uh, bricks here, the hierarchical temporal Mamba blocks and then the bidirectional spatial Mamba blocks. These blocks are specifically engineered to enhance temporal alignment, thereby augmenting the model's ability to bidirectionally capture skeleton level density features compared to previous diffusion-based method generations methodologies that predominantly use transformer blocks. Our motion Mamba achieves state-of-the-art performance, evident in an improvement of 50% FID scores and quadruple improvement in inference speed. It's not quite state-of-the-art, but when it when they were designing this, it, it was state-of-the-art, but now a bunch of other people publish papers, so it's it's, it's in the top, but it's not 100%. The effectiveness and efficiency of our proposed motion mambas have been roughly demonstrated, make marking a significant leap forward in the field of human motion generation. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Let's uh, go back to the beginning. Let me sip some water. Let me see if you guys have questions, and then we'll summarize these two papers and get you guys going. Question from Mobo. Can you talk about your background? I don't know what you mean. I use like a green screen, so it like removes it. And then I actually use the digital eye. So these aren't even my eyes. Look at this. See that? They're fake eyes. And then I'm wearing a, a little funny hat just to, you know, Look cool. Uh, accuracy at 598. What do you mean 99? 98.9898. Okay, so someone's uh, being a little bit of a stickler. Me seeks here. Apparently 98.9. .9. They're saying this is not 98. Yeah, you have to go all the way down to here to number 12 to get to this 97. 98 but I don't know don't don't put too much on these right like like I said before these benchmarks are not that good like these benchmarks are flawed so like past a certain point like the the ones that are getting the highest scores they're not getting the highest scores because they're doing something necessarily better they're getting the highest scores because they're just overfitting more right a lot of times if you just want to beat these benchmarks if you just put in a bunch of inductive biases that are specific to this data set and then just have the biggest possible model capacity, you can get really high scores on these benchmarks, but it doesn't actually mean that the, the architectures and the techniques that you used are actually good for other stuff, right? So yeah, be careful with the necessarily just assuming that the top of these benchmarks are, are the best because a lot of times all they're doing is just overfitting to the benchmark. He may ask academic background. So, I mean, you can look at my resume. I'm pretty sure I have it. You can go here. 
I think here. So on my GitHub, I have this website and this is my background. If you're interested, I kind of just been all over the place, kind of a generalist, you know, not necessarily a specialist, but I've been reading papers for a long time. So that's what I do. All right. Uh, let's review these papers. All right. So today we had another battle of the Mambas and this wasn't really a head to head battle because these are not even necessarily the same data modality, right? So this paper video Mamba was dealing with video understanding where you're consuming a sequence of frames, uh, where each frame is like an image and then you have a sequence of them. It's a video. The other paper we reviewed, this was called Motion Mamba. This one is dealing with uh, sequences of keyframes where the keyframe is basically uh, the joint angles for a skeleton or an armature. So different data modalities, but it was two different Mamba papers that came out at the same time. So I was like, hey, you know what? Let's just read both of these and see which one is better, you know, even if it's apples to oranges kind of comparison here. So Mamba models are what's called state space models, which means that what a Mamba model is fundamentally doing is it's calculating this hidden state H, which is a vector, right? It's like a representation of the information that it has read, right? So it's going through this hidden state. It's going through this sequence of things and it's creating this this hidden state and it predicts the final thing that you want based on this hidden state but that hidden state is capped right so there's like a there's like a limit to the size of this hidden state so no matter how long your sequence is you're just the you have the same amount of memory kind of one way to think about it is that uh, a state space model is like your your you have like a basket that has a limited size and you keep going through the aisles of this grocery store and you can put things into the basket and out of the basket and put things into the basket and out of the basket, but you can't increase the size of the basket. It's always the same basket size, right? So that means that Mamba models are very efficient com and you basically the, the complexity and compute uh, and memory requirements scale linearly with respect to the to the size of the sequence, right? So even if you have a very very long grocery aisle that you're walking down, you're you're still you you only have that limited little basket. So as you're putting things in and out and in and out and in and out, you're you're just going to linearly scale with the length of that grocery. Maybe I shouldn't use this grocery analogy, but whatever, it's an analogy. Uh, attention based models, which is what you're usually used to they scale quadratically with respect to the input length because what they're doing is they're basically comparing every single part of that sequence with every single other part of that sequence. And Jeff Dean says that's a good thing, right? Because the reason it's a good thing is because you now can do all that computation in parallel, right? If you're not limit, if you're not basically putting things in and out of your little limited basket, you don't have to wait until you get to that part of the grocery aisle to then put things in and out of your basket. You can compute all of it in parallel. And we live in an age where we have computers that are specifically very good at computing everything in at once, right? In a, in a giant parallel computation. So transformers, they are built on this intuition that, hey, just compute all of the attention map and then we'll figure out what to pull from that, right? Then we'll have this uh, attention operation that kind of looks at all of the computation that you've done and pulls out the important information from that. Versus a state space model is doing that at every single base, at every single kind of sequential step, right? It's figuring out what to put into this hidden state every single time. So it's faster if you have a very long sequence, but if you can just compute all of them at once, then the attention uh, or the transformer has less of an inductive bias and therefore you can get more powerful representations potentially, right? Because in a state space model, maybe you're kind of moving along the sequence and you decide, okay, I don't actually care about this little piece of information, so I'm just going to forget that, right? But then 10 steps down the row or down the line, 
you're suddenly like, wait a second, if I would have remembered that, then I would have been able to do something with that, right? So there's a little bit of an, of a, of an inductive bias in a states-based model that as you move along the sequence, things that are further back in time are less important to what you have now versus a transformer has, doesn't have that inductive bias at all, right? Everything is kind of treated equally and the attention map treats things that are far away in time about the same as things that are closer to the sequence. So I think that's a little bit of a summary of why states-based models are different and better than attention models in some situations, specifically situations where you have long sequences. And both of the modalities that they use in this paper or in these papers are, are those types of things, right? So it's a long sequence of motions and a long sequence of frames. So the, the longer your sequence, the more these Mamba state-based models are going to be good. The smaller your sequences the more the transformers are probably just going to be better. Okay. Uh, what else? We also looked at both of these papers go through different types of scanning. So in this, I think the scanning, this one has nice pictures for scanning, but scanning is the idea of how you're going through your sequence with this state space model. And usually the scanning isn't, uh, just one way, right? It's not like you're reading your video from uh, left to right, top to down, and then you're just going through the time dimension as is, right? You can do more fancy fancy types of scanning, such as bi-directional scanning, where you're going from the first top corner of the first video all the way to the bottom corner of the last frame. And bi-directional is you also do the other side as well. So you're kind of scanning through your sentence both ways. I think this picture shows it well. So you're going through all your tokens this way, and then you're going all through all your tokens this way. So you get, you kind of, in a way, reduce the likelihood that you forget things because you're going through the whole sequence both ways. So that's bi-directional scanning. There's a similar kind of scanning trick, I guess. It's not similar, but they're also fancy scanning that goes on with this motion generation paper where, in this case, they're doing a diffusion model. So ultimately they're taking these motions, they're using a VAE to compress it into these latent spaces. And as you're compressing it, right, you're, you have this hierarchy of, of blocks and those blocks, when you're dealing with the, the wider or the lower level block here, compared to the higher level or kind of narrower, smaller block here, you probably want to scan slightly differently. And the intuition that they build in this paper is they say that basically, depending on where you are in this encoder decoder, you're going to use a different uh, number of scans. So as you get closer and closer to that kind of like compressed high level information, you're going to scan less here, S1, as opposed to when you're at the kind of base, you're going to scan more. And they call this hierarchical scanning. So I think I showed this. Yeah, so the intuition here is that this is actually almost opposite because you, this the dimensionality of this uh, area is going to be smaller than this because this is a higher up, right? So generally, as you're closer to your input data, it's going to be wider. And when I say wider, think of it just as like more the vector is, is like bigger. There's the information is just, there's more spread out. There's more crap in there. There's more redundancy. As you go closer and closer to the higher level features, it's going to be narrower, which means that it's more abstract, more semantic here. They're showing you inside a convnet. You have, for example, edges compared to faces, but here it's a little bit more abstract, right? Maybe at the lower levels, it's like specific angle movements, and then when you get to the higher levels, it's more abstract, like the concept of walking or the concept of dancing, right? And it's like the vector kind of represents that higher level semantic concept. So that's the scanning, hierarchical scanning. This one also has another trick they do. They also do the bi-directional scanning in the, in the spatial dimension. So the spatial dimension here is not uh, the frames of a video. So it's not spatial in terms of the height and width of the frame of a video. Here, the spatial direction is basically the uh, head to toe, toe to head kind of thing. So the skeleton is like, 
basically a vector and then you can you can think of it as going down that vector so maybe the first joint is the head then the second joint is the shoulder then the other shoulder that's one direction and the other direction would be you start basically from the feet up i don't actually know if it's the feet and the head i'm just kind of saying that but that's the same kind of idea of like the spatial and then time dimensions and scanning through those in a clever way what else Okay, so this video paper, there is one extra thing I wanted to mention here. They do this weird type of distillation where they distill from a smaller teacher model to a larger student model, which is extremely unusual. Usually it's a distillation happens from a larger teacher model into a smaller student model. But the reason they do this is because I think the, the data sets they train on are small and they're training these things from scratch. So the small models don't overfit. And then because the small models don't overfit, they'll distill into the bigger model so that the bigger model is kind of learning the abstraction that the smaller model learned because if they just trained the big model from scratch on this small data set, it would overfit. So kind of a weird situation that they got themselves into, but they found an even weirder fix to that weird situation. All right. Uh, in terms of results, both of these papers kind of claim state-of-the-art to some degree. The Motion Mamba paper is a little bit closer to it, so it does beat all the previous uh, results in Kit ML and Human ML 3D, which are, I think, the best benchmarks for motion synthesis. They're the top two that appear here on uh, papers with code, so at least they're using correct benchmarks. Uh, there, it's not necessarily state-of-the-art right now because there's other papers that kind of got released at the same time that have slightly better scores, but uh, certainly more honest than this paper here. The Video Mamba paper doesn't even get the best results compared to the shittier models that they're comparing to. So granted, this benchmark is not that great. I think Kinetics 400, which is the benchmark that they choose it is a good. It is a the go-to action classification benchmark, but it's like a classification video understanding date uh, benchmark, which means that you're classifying these tiny 10-second videos into 400 categories, which just seems very prone to overfitting. So I don't know. It's, it's difficult to see if this is actually better or worse than the transformer models. But either way, both of these papers. It's not necessarily the perf the the quality and the performance in terms of like a raw quality kind of metric, such as here accuracy. I think the the benefit of both of these papers because they're both Mamba papers is going to be that they're fast. And ultimately, I feel like this paper does a better score or better makes a better point of like constantly mentioning that hey, you know what? At the end of the day, the whole point is that this motion Mamba is significantly faster. As you can see here, average inference time compared to all the other previous works. That's it, guys. I don't know. Kind of confusing. I feel like I bounced all over the place, you know? Might have been a little bit of a confusing stream. I appreciate uh, this guy here, Zeyu Zhang. He joined us. He was here. He gave us a bunch of feedback. He was talking. So hats off to Zeyu Zhang for helping us understand and parse through his paper. And maybe as a final point here, who won in the Battle of the Mamba? So <laughs> maybe it's because I'm scared or maybe it's because I'm biased, but I actually think this paper was better. I think the Motion Mamba was a little bit better. I think that they got better results. And I think that they more clearly stated uh, the benefit of Mamba models, which is based on this uh, fact that they're linear complexity, so they're faster. This paper was a little bit, maybe this one had better figures. I like this figure. This was a nice little pretty figure, but the results aren't necessarily that great. So I don't know. We'll leave it at that. You won the Battle of the Mambas. All right. Any other questions?
Any final points, say you? <laughs> what do you think? Do you think you could beat this guy in one one on one combat? Kun Chong Li? You and Kun Chong Li in a pit filled with snakes. Who wins? <laughs> All right, I don't know. I'm just wasting your guys' time. All right, thanks everybody for listening. Thanks, 87, Zayu, No Free Will, Loic, Aries, Emily, Ed, Ruslan, Long, Mobo, 2ARX, Heliophobic Dude, who else? More Ruslan, Octon, Post Tokka, Vincent, Pratyush, Majetti, Mama DCSC, Rumpel, Ice River. Thanks everybody for watching. Hope you had a great time. Join us tomorrow if you're interested in, uh, I think tomorrow we have a paper on multimodal pre-training. So we're looking at a paper that Apple released. So let's see what happens there. Here's our little Steve Jobs cat. If you're interested in vision language models and pre-training, join us for that. If not, have a great weekend. See you guys later. Here's the Aztec death whistle to close us off.